Hello everyone, today we talk about the Augustan monetary policy. Not entirely, we'll have to make at least a couple of other videos to frame the topic a bit better, but mostly observing how overall um, Augustus coped with the political balance um, of the senatorial order and the um, the other estates right through such monetary establishment the, the changes were not let's say radical in a in a social sense on the contrary Augustus fundamentally also sided um, slightly more in favor of the aristocracy demanding more than before however what really was the big deal here was the establishment of a fully uh, say professional permanent army with uh, soldiers remaining in service for 20 years it really cost a, a, a huge lot and that was fundamentally covered as we will see now by the uh, fiscus that would uh, develop in parallel to the uh, traditional aerarium to the point of fundamentally taking it over which consisted in the imperial income right not quite the imperial household one it was another um, let's say we developed uh, within it, but the money that was properly required to administer the imperial provinces of the empire that were uh, in part the either the richest, at least among the richest, and especially the most strategically relevant ones, so that had a specific military function, most obviously in the frontier. Um, an example: uh, the Rhine and and the Danube right but also Egypt that wasn't threatened really by anyone at that point but still had to be controlled directly by uh, imperial forces as the the, the, the the direct control of the um, Egyptian grain was crucial of course for the functioning of the empire and so on at this point the Romans had gathered basically the greatest amount of wealth ever uh, in history like not even Alexander's empire had had so much money and albeit was this this massive re uh, uh, recompaction politically speaking at the end of the civil war the restoration of the golden age under um, Octavian Augustus Egypt the balance of this system was very delicate because delicate was uh, of course uh, pre-industrial uh, economy so we will see about certain levels of taxations that for you know, today's standards are ridiculous, but that at the time were heavily felt and that, however, were needed to keep the system together, as it would fundamentally last, right, for 300 years, uh, aside from further monetary uh, reforms, especially uh, Nero's one, right, Nero was actually one of the greatest Roman emperors, you know, they, we know just the gospel of it, but establish certain things that would last for quite a long time, stabilize a lot of provinces, You'll see him at some point. We still haven't quite um, discussed that. Today we do not also look just at, at Augustus per se, but how Augustus' monastery reform uh, was um, in fact um, let's say fared uh, in broadly met in, uh, in the following generations. Right? And how uh, this the system was something more than just, in fact, a, uh, an economical one. It was primarily based on a moral principle, right? That is the way we should start to to relearn history through substantially. Um, so uh, there had definitely been in Augustan times um, an intensification of monetary uh, exchange, also production, um, and the, the the important, in fact, um, regulation through the same of the entire empire. Um, this entailed also the systematization, in fact, of the monetary output as such, that were stabilized in the sense that the aureus, that is to say one for uh, one fortieth of, of a pound e equated to twenty five denarii of silver. This would that is one eighty fourth of a pound and to one hundred 
uh, copper sesterci, right? So that um, would remain, as in, for those who know the proportions here, but the the axis for for a lot of the you know the, the exchange for uh, the monetary exchange for for a long time, right? Um, and while the uh, coins in gold and in silver were fundamentally minted by the imperial authority, the uh, the 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 bronze one of Italy, at least, was carried out by the Senate specifically. Naturally, the denarius destined to, as Tacitus says, the minuta ac vilia commercia, that is to say, you know, the small and, you know, somehow lowly business, right, uh, commerce, and confirmed so, like, by, by the, still by the 4th century, by the apusculum of the Derebus Bellicis, uh, was especially the currency of the, that kind of, mm, Trade, kind of commercial middle class, we could say, small um, bourgeoisie, right? To to use anachronistic terms, more or less this that had been very important in the um, in the balance of the uh, the Augustan regime, that as we've seen in other videos also relied uh, importantly, in fact, not just on the on the senators and on the knights. And that were also fundamentally the latter being having the same objectives of of the centers, but still being kind of hungrier and having to to rise it to the top. But properly of the kibes, right of the kibes romani, uh, that either through through their, their their legal freedom, also the kind of social promotion. Think about the army, and so how important, in fact. The, as we'll see now, the taxes were imposed to maintain that. Also entailed this, this system of social promotion from the side of those who were already Roman citizens, would be the legionary forces, but also the peregrini, and thus the, the, also the, the, the auxiliary, and those who were serving for becoming Roman citizens, and leaving essentially a condition of, in fact, a middle class, of owning a, a farm, uh, cattle, slaves, right? Nothing exceptional, but still, you know, a privilege con considering the times, historically. Um, so, this um, smaller currency, the uh, denarius, uh, will mm, tend to lose weight over time by the will of the same middle class, that by reducing it, would increase the purchase power of silver to the detriment of gold. We'll see this better because it's a bit of a light motive in this early imperial um, Roman uh, monetary history. Um, and generally speaking, you know that, however, the augurs would, on the longer run, uh, manage to, 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 to maintain its centrality. Uh, it couldn't be otherwise in this world, first of all, but um, at least um, maintaining a balance between the, the currency of the aristocracy and the one of the, of the middle classes was um, uh, a matter of great concern for all the emperors of, of, this, uh, of this era. Right. In, in the reign of Augustus, uh, the princeps had attempted um, to, to, to establish, as we were saying before, a specific balance between the, the great assets right, and the uh, small landowners, uh, so the latifundial holders and the kind of average citizen that just wanted to have uh, a living right, as a, as a freeman out here, um, with a balance, however, that was objectively to the advantage of the great landowners anyway, right? The balance that Augustus had established between the Aureus and the Denarius uh, was in favor of, of gold. 
uh, and uh, those who owned it more more likely. This naturally stemmed from the fact that Rome had already been by the time of Octavian's rise to power fundamentally dominated by an oligarchy that was the one of the great landowners of the great uh, um, aristocratic clients, the most noble ones, just think about the saying against Julia, which um, Octavian uh, was, was himself part. So uh, the sense of nobility staying, even though Augustus actually had, a, had an equestrian uh, origin, given that he descended, in fact, from uh, still a very affluent, though, in fact, um, equestrian branch of the Gens uh, Octavia, um, was unavoidably dominated by these groups. Again, the same equestrians were projected towards uh, the top, and that was their deal. So there was no way. Uh, and also, yeah, I mean, not even with the power that uh, definitely Octavian had at the end, by uh, the end of the civil wars, to unhinge the system, right? The Roman Empire worked on the base of its oligarchy. There was still a, a virtuous, um, especially with with the new Roman conquests and colonizations, and so this, the the successful and and very hard enterprise of of Octavian to pay all the veterans of the civil wars with an enormous amount of land in the provinces, so establishing. Um, uh, a permanent professional backbone that would support properly the, the imperial power. The sense with normal uh, legionnaire was, uh, say, an average citizen there, and that thus, in order to be mobilized by the aristocracy, was at least to to do so within, from Augustus onwards, uh, the existence of a of a permanent state military, right, and so. Uh, for anyone who was aiming at, at the top, and the clever systematization, as we've seen, between the um, imperial and senatorial provinces uh, of the empire that reflected that, okay, this is the emperors, this is the senators, right? So the senators would have, uh, in any case, even after the purges, the prescriptions, the, the, the natural fear and power that Augustus instilled were the same shareholders of this uh, stability, right? And that's the same. Princeps didn't have any any interest in in unhinging, right? And as we will see now, the country um, was was given a, a place of honor by the same emperor in, in the system because these noblemen were the ones who had to maintain properly the moral standards of. Uh, of the establishment, politically, militarily, but also in the family, with the moral laws that uh, Augustus was famous, we'll talk about that in the end, about this kind of re-spiritualization of the system, the literal repristination of the golden uh, age, and um, in a dramatically successful way, because there was here a system who lasted again for 300 years, without change, and this was created over for the first time in Roman history with that scale of, of of mindset and stability, right? China didn't quite have this, for example. Uh, it was also a much lighter system in many ways. I mean, it was really more found than in this kind of still, if you want, tribal mindset of the Romans on the sense that there was, again, a, a sacredness, a holiness, you know, properly in the right of bearing arms, so that the emperor himself was representing the collective worth of the system, which indeed made things flowing very smoothly um, at this point, right? And aside from kind of a bit uh, Achilles' heels of, of, Roma, of the Roman political system, there was most of the imperial succession, which was never defined, because again, the Romans could not think that things laid simply in a, you know, a predetermined, um, you know, fashion, right? Power was power for what it was power for real. It, was, it couldn't be just about being part of a single family. That had an importance. But it was, it's what you personally did that truly, truly mattered. And that's uh, why, as we will see now, Augustus' uh, moral laws were pretty harsh, after all, on the aristocracy. Also, as far as the 
financial contribution here was was concerned right so in order naturally however to preserve this enormous imperial power that augustus had from his just you know in fact he had become dramatically wealthy um during you know by his family but from uh, just by the role he was called to perform as caesar's uh, adoptive son but just you know during the the second triumvirate during uh, during all the prescription, so all the, the all the deaths of, of his political opponents, and finally the the, the victory over Egypt and the, the astronomic amount of, of wealth that really flowed at this point only under this kind of concentrated power, right? Then began naturally to 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 structure itself accordingly in a in a more centralized way, like. Uh, a state worth of, it, of this name, right, to hold that degree of, of of the top military in the world, and that point only could could work like. Um, so this is the reason why Augustus, while fixing this monetary uh, balance, was giving um, start to the constitution of the fiscus, right. Um, and so, to make the long sh story short of the system of imperial income, right, based on the administration of the imperial provinces, that would create essentially another treasure next to the old Aerarium, a temple of Saturn, uh, etc. We'll talk about that. Uh, if you want, on another occasion. So the the fiscus took time to be um, uh, created because to at least to be um, f organized uh, for good, right? In fact, it's just under Claudius that we can say this. This was fully this enterprise was fully accomplished because naturally you had to structure this essentially foreign. Uh, countries, especially some we mentioned before, like like Germany or Egypt, that were not historically like you know areas where the Romans had maintained a kind of a kind of a firm holding. So they had literally to structure them in a way um, they could draw the resources efficiently, um, that they could simply occupy, militarize the areas, and maintain, in fact, an iron fist that would last uh, throughout basically. All the the, uh, the the principate, in fact, um, to literally finance uh, an imperial state next to the private senatorial one. Again, this is crucial because the senators, by a degree, were left by Augustus saying, uh, saying like, okay, you have your own provinces. That's it. You will administer them. There is, of course, a law. You cannot. Uh, go without limits, but there was no reason, like, you know, administering areas like Gaul or Spain or whatever, you know, to, to make anything there. These were the same lands that the same, that the aristocrats wanted to, uh, to, to establish themselves in. Also, as you know, some emperors of Italic origin would come back to Rome as such, um, you know, with overwhelming wealth, in fact, from the most fertile areas that had been well administered and uh, cultivated by uh, the Romans, uh, and where Romanization, in fact, was the the most the most effective, as we hinted at before, for the payment of the veterans, Augustus provided through the same military aerarium, meaning that again, what pertained the army now was properly an imperial business and it's in its own regard because it's as if the emperor had practically owned literally all those provinces uh, just as the senators owned their own, right? So th he would provide that. So how did he find the money practically? Well, he destined an indirect tax of 1% on selling. The famous centesima venalium uh, so much that Augustus' successor, Tiberius, could say that, literally, militare aerarium eo subsidio niti, that is to say, literally, the, the, the military aerarium is founded all, right, on, on that tax, as such, 
right? This was a big deal because it was literally on the selling of the entire uh, empire, uh, the transactions occurring under Roman law, right? There was, um, in addition to this, another tax, the vicesima, so the, a twentieth, five percent, on the inheritance and donations established by. Augustus, um, there had been actually some um, some precedence to this. Uh, in any case, the Vicesima was established in 6 AD. Um, the Centesima Venalium um, was actually felt by the people, the populace, more than by the privileged orders. Right, this is obvious because it mostly hit every transaction as such. As we will see now, the the um, the vicesima instead was more felt naturally by those who uh, had big transactions going on, mostly you know, also inheritance, um, donations, dowries. Uh, etc. So we're talking about big land owners that had to pay a consistent part, one twentieth of those possessions for for changing, say hands, for changing property, um, and um, it, it's very meaningful. However, regarding the Cantesima Venalium, that uh, it would be exactly the populace after Augustus' death. So in the first years of the Principatus of Tiberius to demand the abolition of this tax, right? And to this request, according to Tacitus, Tiberius um, could, not, uh, could not do anything, really, uh, because uh, that's when he said it, literally, that the military aerarium was founded all on that tax. So cutting that would, would have been sort of a populistic measure that would have made essentially the, the, the financial means to just to, to pay the army that was by far in fact the, the most expensive but also the most efficient element of the Roman arm uh, of the Roman state um, and that uh, on the basis of which in fact the entire empire rested as a consequence right uh, and again the the the, the, the populistic idea here is, is concrete because as you understand the Romans had achieved an unprecedented power historically speaking so the the entire system was founded on, on that very tax think about today's times right this you know we're talking about the early Roman Empire was actually a florid time of expansion but naturally was seen more uh, was more static than 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 today, so these taxes were were a big deal because they 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 were relatively innovative, and they were essentially felt like a just like a permanent uh, burden over just a system that, considering the crop rate of again the pre-industrial world was was not thought to 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 grow to the progressive fortunes of like we would be habituated to the multiple points percentage. Right, it was uh, felt like a more epoch-making um, provision, which indeed r was right. But in here, the connection with the army is, is fascinating because it's again a populistic stance against military expenses, which is naturally ridiculous because uh, the entire civilization is based on this, um, and the. Uh, the, the the obvious uh, need uh, to maintain this 20 years long military service that would effectively make up the Roman legionary forces plus naturally the the auxiliary ones and allowing thus also the the, the system to regenerate itself to integrate further those elements in, in Romanization through essentially making them become Roman citizens and with all the that this you know with, with the land with, with the money that they had deserved during their their service was 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 again necessary could not be eliminated and um, there is however always some of the complaints about these things 
In fact, the, the entire phrase here in Latin is, as we partly mentioned before, militare aerarium eo subsidio niti, simul imparem oneri rem publicam nisi vicesimo militiae anno veterani dimitterentur. So, literally, like, you, you cannot take this away, because otherwise we wouldn't have the 20 years um, uh, veteran force that uh, fundamentally our entire concept of of uh, world dominance and moral superiority and civilizational capacity would, um, would, would collapse, right? It didn't really make sense. This was a contribution, naturally, as well to the Roman citizens. Um, and uh, not only naturally, but for, for a system that they were called to preserve from actually a position of privilege. Because again, especially at this point, being a Roman citizen was, was a, a big deal, right? Even the poorer elements had fundamentally their living within their community under naturally some aristocratic clientele already, but they had specific rights that could not be touched, and everybody was pursuing. Uh, the way for for citizenship, because that was the way of, again, having your own uh, your own full rights, your own your own. Very often that you were elected to that just because of of the status you already you already had or you had just acquired, especially through the military service. So it was, again, just how the world traditionally recognized itself in its worth and power, right? Um. And the other element is naturally understanding, and we discussed this uh, also in that video about the farsightedness of a Roman strategy. That is to say, a Roman um, strategic mindset was radically aggressive, right? The way the Romans um, established their own boundaries, right, in the form of actual legionary detachment in some areas was naturally meant for controlling far beyond um, those places towards say the outer world right and it was based on the concept of a actually of, of um, you know of limit of course of, of being always at the limit of resources for the possibility of um, uh, occasionally sending those forces further out, right, for maintaining, again, the, uh, the, with the minimum cost, right, the greatest military capacity here. And the, in fact, the Roman forces were even very few. Um, and there were just uh, 125,000 legionnaires, plus, plus uh, the same amount of auxiliaries for, 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 uh, for an incredibly long uh, what we see perimeter, but that fundamentally you have to consider also in depth, um, that was enough as a deterrence to maintain for centuries the, the peoples inside and outside of this perimeter under Rome. And um, the, 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 the military thought there was naturally not a defensive one, not say, let's send as much soldiers as we can because we can't hold this. No, the, the concept behind this is that it was the sheer quality of the Roman military could afford to maintain such few troops uh, in control of such a large amount of people all over continental Europe, the, the Near East, um, and, and beyond. Right. So this thing was naturally... The product of a century-old Roman military um, culture and uh, a dramatically well-oiled military machine that, however, for maintaining such an extended empire and conquering actually other lands successfully as it would happen throughout this period, fundamentally uh, had to be uh, permanent, professional, thus extremely qualitative, uh, in a way it had never been before, right? And, and and the permanence, so the maintenance of the quality over time, that, that's the incredible thing, right? So th this explains you once more why this tax could, could absolutely not be eliminated, right? And it actually represented the same privilege of the Roman people to rule over the rest of the world functionally. 
uh, as such. Right? So this is like again the same people today say we shouldn't be paying the military because because what? So that you can be a lesser people, right? Uh, because that's where it gets down. To. The the people that do not understand the, the the connection between politics and violence and do not know how to fight and are incapable and haven't the pale study of how history works, or strategy works, or whatever, and fail constantly, are the lesser people that cannot afford to exist on the world stage, right? And this is an anti-traditional ideology that cannot properly have the right to exist, right? Simply because people who own it get wiped out. Um, and looking at the Roman world well, would be a very high source of spiritual... Uh, acculturation for any average person in the world today, I think. Uh, I um, strongly believe that without recognizing what was established in the Augustan area, basically, you could, it, there is no sense even properly living your life as a human being. It doesn't make any sense. right? It's that simple. For what happened during Augustan times, also religiously speaking, um, ignoring that this was a thing, that was this was a massive watershed in the history of the creation uh, is basically just remaining a child for the rest of your life. And this is as easy as it gets, really. Um, in, in any case, um, the the importance here, especially in Tiberius' answers, l l shows you that the effort was done, right? The, the sense of, of greatness in maintaining this also taxation system standing, right? Um, because it doesn't, it's not just about providing the legionnaires with equipment, with the gear, with everything. Um, it's also literally where does that stuff come from, right? So the the idea that here we have, um, uh, we can think of the stipendiorum tarditas, the sense of the, in fact, the 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 need in the regularity of the legionary paying. Right, that was was a thing throughout all history. Just all the military, um, the soldier of any country, of every people. At some point before, especially contemporary era, was didn't have the means to maintain um, constants, right? A continuity, a uniformity, a, a regularity in the pay, right? Um, and definitely the Augustan system here was pretty efficient as far as that was concerned as well because the troops could be rewarded in other ways. Naturally, Augustus had mostly paid them in, in land. And talking about the veterans of the Civil War, there were really an oceanic amount of, of, of people and dangerous ones because they knew how to, to slaughter large numbers if just, you know, properly equipped. So th there was a, had been a, a huge question in many ways. Western Europe was full of, of, of again, of warlike people, mostly uh, now under, under Rome and in part made up by the same Romans. Um, and this had to be satisfied as Roman citizens, as auxilia, as subjected people. Uh, and this system was the guarantee that that would remain standing, functioning, again, you know, well oiled way into the standards of military superiority that the Roman army had uh, affirm had been affirming at that point. Now, um, uh, th this this shows you also the, the difficulty naturally in the rule, right? When we talk about this great empire, so we think, oh my god, this was smooth sailing, right? You know, you're Augustus at the end of the Civil War. Um, uh, civil Wars, yeah, everything is, is fine. No, it, it ain't, right? It was always extremely difficult to rule something like the Roman Empire and that's also a bit like the same question why why asking what how, why the Roman Empire fell by a degree by the way why don't we ask how was it possible to maintain with the means of the time do you realize what the means of the time really were even just in terms of communication or um, with that th in fact thin amount of troops that hell of an empire Right, and managing all the rest to, to keep going, to be expanding, to be building, to be... It, it was uh, an, an unspeakable success. And that's the reason why you can see Roman stuff all over Europe and the Mediterranean, and supposedly, like, even if the, the Greeks were more technologically advanced than the Romans, 
uh, that at this point were implementing on their, uh, in fact, on the Atlantic um, scientific acquisitions. Uh, you don't see much kind of, you know, Atlantic aqueducts or roads or whatever. That was a specific reason. Rome was there for centuries and centuries on end, building, upkeeping, making things functioning changing literally the language of entire land masses of the regional scale of Gaul, of, of Spain, etc. Uh, without even carrying out an ethnic substitution that of course was beyond their means nor also their, their interest for the sheer accomplishment of the Roman citizenry in this sense. So also the ones that had to pay this uh, tax. Reflect about that when you whine because gas Oh my god, you know, it's, it's too costly, whatever, so like, this will dictate my foreign policy. How brain damaged can you be? Because that, I can't think of another reason, right? With all the respect to people who are actually brain damaged in, 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 the, in the clinical sense, but uh, there is a level of mental damage that surely affects even the way your own brain works, because I can think how th this, this would, would be otherwise. Just remember that these people at the time, that of course you will never be any uh, any trace of you know of superior to them by any stretch of the imagination, were able to make these things work, but you wouldn't be able to do anything just if, if they took your phone away. Right? It passes from things like this. Right? Taxes are not the evil mean to impose whatever, because if you do not have that mean, everything collapses anyway. So there is not a magic better world where there are no taxes and things work well, right? You know, unless, you know, you are God yourself, you, it, it doesn't work like that. And definitely you're very far from that, given that you're consistently worse morally, personally, and culturally than people who lived 2,000 years ago. And that were capable of doing this with much greater effort than anything that you do today, right? So that's the actual point. Um, now, the... Um, the 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 necessity of of defense, the necessity of compensating the veterans after this long military service, is essentially the also from a monetary point of view that the way that the empire substantiates itself, the centesima venalium would be abolished at a point by an emperor that we discussed and that I took kind of a, a positive. Uh, approach towards um, that is Caligula uh, who was notoriously close to the plebecula at least in a uh, again in kind of a, in a monarchic way more for the people than the actual uh, the, the, the nobility that loaded this kind of the reduction of its own power because that could also erode this system right and we actually observed in that video on Caligula that there is no proof that he was that bad of a of an administrator or, or of a ruler or that, that he squandered his money at all right uh, at his death there was also plenty of money uh, for Claudius and in general um Again, you know that the, the Julio Claudians were a bit like uh, suffering of bad, uh, of bad papyrus. We're not saying bad press uh, from the um, from the Flavian, from the Flavian historians, and from generally speaking, from the senators that again were the ones who would have also liked to to pay less taxes themselves, and they de facto did in a sense because. Again, the system had already proven, as we were saying before, that they still were the ones uh, the, on which most of the system also rested in, in a, at least in a vertical sense, right? Hierarchy that definitely more than that one percent tax passed through through the hands of of the senators, at least through their through, through their latifundia, right? Through their administrators, through their slaves. And the people who lived um, within their clientele, right? So this is including the Roman citizens who paid in part the tax. So again, it was um, intertwined, but definitely the um, the great landowner that didn't care so much about uh, things like the centesima, right? Um, differently, uh, uh, by the way, 
the the Centesima Venalium would be uh, reestablished by an unknown emperor later on after Caligula, probably right right after. We don't know. However, it was necessary again. They needed that money, and uh, as you know, so the 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 Roman military didn't undergo any significant change uh, in the meanwhile as well. So they found the means, the ways to still make it work uh, with by restoring the, the same centesima, but means that probably had substituted it by a degree. Differently, um, for, the, for the nobility instead, the vicesima, so again, the, the inheritance tax fundamentally, in fact, on, uh, also on the donations and gifts and so on, was uh, thought by Augustus definitely to hit the most affluent. And this, interestingly enough, also remained always showing the power of uh, of the emperor, of the monarchy, how it had been de facto um, structuring itself by this point in the Res Publica. And for this reason, given that also all the historiographers were were senators, uh, or almost at least the most important one, um, the Vicesima was constantly considered the heavier uh, tax for the Roman citizens. Which, overall, it, it wasn't, right? At least this weight also on, on the rest uh, of, of the Romans, but it was obviously meaningful for those who were more uh, likely to 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 move to sell to inherit sizable, uh, sizable assets, so much so that Pliny the Younger would have um, indicated the gravity of such tax uh, in a in a panegyric, an official panegyric to Trajan. So he basically stated that out loud. It, it is um, the tributum um, heredibus domesticis grave, right? And also with the institution of this tax, Augustus was looking far beyond, right? Was indicating basically that his work at the head of the repristination of the golden age in the universe had not to be understood as the interest of this or that order, this or that class. He had... We have seen it many videos about Augustus, I must say, at least about him, but we've made enough on, on other Roman emperors we still have, because of the randomness of this topic cycles, to, to, to tell a lot. But, you know, he had gone beyond, right, definitely any other politician, I think historically there's no one can compare, um, in founding, for good, right, an, an optimus status that, again, had to be the perfect one, the, the golden age a red vibe, right? In which all um, the involved, all the Roman citizens, so the nobility, even the wealthier, let's say the, the, the knights, for example, had to contribute for the good of the communitas. Um, and in this sense, being under a higher uh, order that was definitely God, and in this sense, Augustus, through his own auspices, right, the medium of, and thus paying um, uh, rightfully part of the, uh, let's say, the entirety, the particular inuriae, right, that were inherent the obvious realization that if Augustus was Augustus as such um, the other people were less as sinners and had to accept to be naturally under an order within a hierarchy with a discipline with an authority above right and this concept besides any other um, practical consideration naturally about the monastery balance and so on has to do properly with the with the idea 
of Augustus, right? A man that, as a good Stoic emperor, understood his role as a statue, that is to say, a duty fundamentally, properly a position, right, above that establishment of the privileged order that um, he thought, however, and rightly, necessary um, and proper to maintain the same optimus status. That is to say, this, of course, the, the traditional view of the wall is that the he who is above has this role to lead. To he has he is there just because he's morally superior to those who are below, but he could not um, have this power if his own virtue didn't make these people obeying. Right and thus. Divine grace um, arriving on him thanks to the to a to a truth that is self evident in the moment in which you 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 recognize it right this is a deeply it's the same concept for example you find in the American Declaration of Independence it's the um, um, the the same uh, in fact, what remained at the base of Western civilization since ever the, the full recognition that um, when things work well, they 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 really succeed, they really achieve something. Otherwise, when there is a failure, even who is at the top, and actually primarily who is at the top, is responsible for that. If not, in this case, responsible for all, because Augustus governed on an ecumenic empire. Thus, all the globe was in his hand. And this was the part of the same imperial ideology shared by all the peoples that were living under Rome and, and beyond, or even under other empires, as a matter of fact, that had pretty much the same, the same doctrine, traditionally. So, um, of course, this was a pretty sound... Um, system, right? It was based on a on a fair uh, negotiation, a fair balance, a fair recognition of established power for all those involved, and that was in fact one of the most single most vital moments and the most orderly fundamentally in the establishment of uh, of the Roman Empire. Right? This was the highest point, arguably, in the history of civilization. Not just given, uh, you know, the 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 endurance of the same system, but also its momentous legacy that has basically never ceased to to exist. Um, it's something goes far beyond. We will talk about um, uh, in another video about Augustus uh, Evangelion. Yes, because the Romans spread a gospel fundamentally. The overlapping with the Christian one is exactly the same thing in in a, in a universal history, right? Of of the spirit, and it's not surprised that Christ was born under Augustus. Um, so when we look at the other measures that that Augustus took, for example, to to really show that yes, he was favoring the the uh, the optimatus in a sense was favoring the senators because of the inherent virtue that they had as historically descending from 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 God um, uh, as as himself even at least against Julia and all her mythology and beyond the role that Caesar had had I uh, will never stress enough how important that video about the Fortuna Kaiser is really is. But he would also give uh, its due, not more, right? In fact, in his, in Augustus' famous uh, demographic legislation, he had meant to express exactly this concept. These are all things we will see in other videos because they pertain to another topic, but they are strictly connected with the monetary policy here. Because with the Lex Iulia in 18 BC and the uh, Papia Popeye of 9 
AD, the unmarried, the celibate heir, um, or, or the one that, that also hadn't had children, were um, deprived of inheritance. Meaningfully enough. So the state, so the empire, would um, seize the property of the decuius, except, however, that naturally the the celibate heir was uh, you know if if he was really among the the, the closest uh, relatives or kins right so it was really not such a brutal thing you you didn't have children at the time of your fa- of your father's death you you're not married you don't have children you, it was important um to have that but in case there was there were other trends this was done to concentrate um um also power in the um it paradoxically making the the aristocracy making more children because that seemed to be an issue right and of course that the wealthiest tend to concentrate more wealth in the hands of fewer children etc now this was instead um um, um you know uh, that he was bypassed by making less children because in the roman law of course uh, every male was to inherit equally right so this um had um you know it was meaning to disperse the the the, the patrimony the fortune this was important also in part to dilute aristocratic power and of course in the traditional doctrine more children you have especially the more powerful you are and the more you basically create your own gangs, your own people right your 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 progeny that if so successful because your success was meant to re-expand that uh, patrimony that fortune further right which is against in fact what would be how basically the entire uh, julio claudian uh, dynasty in part also uh, the flamian would be right the idea that in fact the senatorial luxus taking over also the uh, the middle classes as we've seen uh, and so especially the more monarchic emperors that were more, say, countered by the nobility, would mostly tendentially favor the the people in, in that in that endeavor because they they recognized that they were more exposed to nobility or power as well. And in this, you got to appreciate at least the fact that Rome went ever more towards a monarchic direction, that there was a system that albeit... Um, kind of dispersing literally the energies were liberated at this point of the golden age um remained the empire in quite in a quite uh, hierarchical sense um as we've seen also from our history of the late roman empire and beyond um and that um at that point at that point mostly had to either change some aspects in order to reorder itself or to cope especially with the people that had um that were at least the, the basis in which that such an elite system could base itself this was not in augustus times where after all in spite of the enormous wealth of some of the greater gentis there was a um there was a balance right represented also by the role of the emperor in the entire in the entire picture and that is surely what we were appreciating here, and the people, and the citizen, right? Um, so um, the the idea here is keep on with the old modus, keep on with the idea that here the the system doesn't have to contract, to sclerotize, to soften up, right? You can imagine the old uh, Augustus thinking about how j- just in fact much more modern and secular his the, the current times were compared to you know the times of, of, of Caesar that he had lived in as a young uh, uh, person so he um, you know th- these are things that especially in moments of great readjustment of great success of great booming you you tend to see right that's what we're complaining today of the fact that yes great expansion but then this at some point stopped and we have to cope with what ha- remains not much because we don't have power. We have actually an overwhelming ma- amount of power, but we're not trained anymore to 
to control it effectively. So we think that kind of even lesser systems are more rampant. Actually, they are, and they're weaker, um, and they are very limited. But somehow, we can still look back at, at what made our success, which is the one that really counted historically, uh, in perspective. And uh, in order to simply say, but it was just that, right? It was just what we really believed up to a very few time ago. And that could simply be recovered with a minimal of of education and goodwill and respect for tradition rather than some strange uh, alienation from reality and kind of creation of safe spaces and thinking that, you know, the stri- knowing ever less has any meaningful spiritual relevance. Um, it's actually not. Right, the world is in the hands of the more powerful, because they earned uh, that power. Surely, more than those who don't have it. It sounds as brutal as it is, but it is true. I mean, if even somebody became powerful with illicit means or with some kind of, you know, undeserved uh, degree, it's still because there is a connection, also genetically, with your family, with, with the accomplishments here involved, generationally speaking. But because where were the others where these people were becoming richer? Where was their great virtue that could stop that and wouldn't? So it's all a pile of of BS. And of course, those who command are the ones more blessed by divine power. And there is no way around that. Um, And no flattery for the underdogs uh, and for whoever just lives in this um, situation of, of perpetual... Um, social envy and it it's, it gets down to the recognition of his own failure basically because that's what it really is um, in any case this is a deep meaning right uh, perhaps departing from the strictly monetary topic but I think that is quite crucial in understanding one of if not the, the most important time in in the history of humanity um, that we will look at in much greater detail, however, as far as the monetary aspect of the story is concerned, because it's, as you know, that's a bit of a fixata question historiographically. Uh, I'm very displeased when I see around videos like, let's explain how the, how the Roman Empire fell, and they make basically a, 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 a 10 minute video explaining just economic data, as if, you know, that was, you know, an explanation of why, you know, powers rise and, and fall, right? It's more like, you know, um, trying to, to, to touch, to, to, to spot, the, to measure the pulse of someone by pretending that's the indicator of what's going on with, you know, with the entire organism without explaining what the organism really is, right? That, and that's unfortunately what also comes with the loss of tradition and the way we um, we are, unfortunately, at this point, habituated to, to look history at, like, um in any case, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.